Hello. Today I'm feeling somewhat invulnerable. Uh, I wouldn't say that I, I'm feeling very comfortable. No, I think comfort is something that I, I, I would unfairly stress, particularly around the, around the shoulders. The rest of you know, around, the, around the body, that's fine, but on the shoulders this is not comfortable and I wouldn't really want to wear it as day-to-day -day clothing. Uh, so what is it that I'm wearing then, this exciting skin of metal? Well, this is my first proper suit of armour that I made. I uh, made this uh, when I was 17. Uh, it wasn't actually the first armour I made. I made another uh, suit of armour when I was about 12 out of cardboard, but I'm not sure that really counts. It wouldn't actually protect you in a fight match. If you want to know uh, what that looked like, well, there was one surviving bit of it uh, when I made the film Crossing the Runes. And if you're fascinated to know what I looked like when I was 15, uh, you, can, you can go elsewhere on YouTube to, to see a film I made when I was 15 using the helmet uh, from that uh, suit of armour. Uh, unfortunately, uh, before I'd finished making the film, my mother threw the helmet away, which was a bit annoying for lots of reasons. One, I really liked it, but also I needed it for a retake, which I then couldn't do because I needed that prop. Um, she knew I hadn't finished the film, but I don't think she approved of the helmet, so away it went. Uh, but then I went to a boarding school where there was a metal workshop, and though I didn't actually do metal work as a subject, it was something that you could choose during your hobby period. So during my official hobbies period, I went to the metal workshop and worked on this. So uh, it's, it's a suit of armour from what period? Yeah, yeah, that's a bit of a moot point. See, I had in my mind that this was from the Dark Ages because I was really into the Dark Ages. I mean, just sound, listen to those words, the Dark Ages. I mean, that, that's how the film Excalibur starts, the Dark Ages. I mean, it, it's just great. It just, it's, it's evocative, isn't it? The Dark Ages. You're not supposed to call them the Dark Ages anymore because people say, actually, they weren't completely dark. And more sober people say this was the migration period or the early medieval period. But damn it, the Dark Ages, which in Britain, uh, the early medieval period is from 10, uh, no it isn't, it's from 410, which is uh, one of the many sackings of Rome, but it's, uh, as according to the traditional English history, that it was the one that really mattered, so it was the end of the Roman period at 410, and 1066 when those ghastly uh, Norsemen came along from their jaunt in, uh, in uh, Normandy and um, uh, knocked out the they didn't really, they didn't replace the population. Only something like a quarter of a percent of the population was Norman, uh, but they just replaced the, the hierarchy, they replaced the people right at the top of the tree. And uh, then you had the, the Norman period, and, and the, the, then the next bit of the medieval period, which some people sometimes call the high medieval period, which is from about 1000 to 1300. And you have feudalism, and oh, it wasn't as much fun. Anyway, the Dark Ages, that's what I was interested in, when men were men and all that sort of stuff. So I had in my mind that this is what plate armour in the Dark Ages looked like, uh, because I'd seen this in, in a, a couple of movies, and movies never get anything wrong, do they? I mean, they must do their research. I mean, they've got a budget and everything. Um, and there was this game called Dungeons and Dragons, which referred to plate mail, you see? And this is like plates, but it, it's mail, isn't it? It's a flexible armour linked together with lots of little chains, so it's like plate mail. This, is, this must be what plate mail looks like, right? Yeah, not exactly. So what actually is this armour? Well, um, uh, some people have said, well, it's, it's like lamellar. Yeah, it is like lamellar in that lamellar is made up of, of little little plates that are often this sort of size and linked together, but uh, this isn't really la lamellar. Um, is it tegulated? That's, that's, a good, that's a good word, isn't it? Tegulated, you know, like slates on a roof. It's not actually arranged like slates on a roof, though, is it? You can see that it's just, it's just a grid. I did try, um, when I first um, put it together, linking it um, like bricks of a house. So instead of four meeting at a, at a oops, I'll try a different one, instead of four plates meeting at a, a single a corner there, um, I, each, each row was staggered with its neighbour, so it was like, like bricks in a house, only going uh, uh, up and down, sort of left to right. Um, but it didn't work. Uh, I, I tried it and the, the R&D just didn't work. It just didn't flex properly, it just jammed all the time. Uh, so I was forced to go uh, to this um, grid pattern, uh, which worked much better, kept its flexibility much better. Uh, also, I was forced to change the size of uh, ring. You may, you may notice that there are actually two sizes of ring. There's the size that's uh, that are holding all these plates together, uh, four along the bottom of each plate and four along the sides of each plate. So that's uh, oh, 16 on each plate. Um, but the, the male that's uh, encompassing my, 
uh, arms here and I got a feeling that my arms when I was 17 must have been a fair bit thinner because these are really really tight on me and I'm not wearing much underneath it. I used to wear a, a thick woolen tunic underneath it, um, underneath this. Uh, but anyway, so that, that, mail, that, that, that uh, mail is made out of smaller rings which I tried on this bit and again didn't flex. It just jammed and it didn't work so I had to reluctantly use much bigger rings which don't look as good and mean that everything's just a bit more open and less protected looking but um, at least it does flex properly and doesn't jam all the flipping time. So there you go. These larger rings uh, in a grid pattern, it worked. I was doing R&D on it, if you like. Um, and uh, of course, there's a big gap here at the top. Um, and that was required because there's, there's a big, big hole in it, you see, which is I had to get my head through somehow. Um, and so I made this male gorget. Uh, <laughs> some people say gorget. No, gorget. We're, we're English, gorget, which is normally tied on with these uh, bits of leather uh, there, but I left them untied because I wanted to take it off to give you a better look at what's doing. It's just a simple flat piece of mail. I didn't know about tailoring and angry. I was new to making mail. I was making it up as I went along. Um, and it's just got a hole in the middle of it, and so that's that's all that that is. And uh, you know, this reveals, you see, the, the quite large and perhaps unsightly a hole at the top and you've got just two plates going over the shoulder. Uh, I found pretty quickly that if I had a plate here uh, it was just too close to my neck and if I raised my arms it all just went and squeezed the either side of the neck. Indeed even with these with this very wide neck hole uh, and these platelets which are only about what, three inches broad something like that there uh, if I get my arms up to there already I'm now pushing into the sides of my neck and it's getting quite uncomfortable I wouldn't want to go any further so I really this is really the maximum uh, plates over the shoulder that I could afford using this design um, and uh, you notice that I've come, come uh, came up with a little cutaway design here so lots of lots of R&D oh yes yes the armpits you notice there's a big there's a big hole under my armpit although you know if in a high budget film like Braveheart even the king of England can have a hole in his armpit then you know, presumably I should get away with... no they didn't have big holes of, in the mail under the armpit it's just that uh, I ran out of links um, and I was also somewhat uncertain as to how I was going to do it anyway because I didn't know about all the various patterns of linking mail in those days. I was just making it up as I went along and uh, I hadn't quite worked it out. But the main reason is I ran out of links. Um, the Making the links was very laborious. I, I got uh, just fencing wire. I started with fencing wire just from a, a shop in the high street which is all galvanised wire. Don't use galvanised wire. People write to me asking what sort of wire they should use and I, I say don't use galvanised wire. It's not authentic which is a zinc plating. It's, they didn't use galvanised wire. Um, uh, if you heat it up uh, you can get the zinc staggers or welders ague or forge fever. These are all names for the same sort of thing which is a uh, an illness you get to, it's quite nasty, only lasts a, a, a day or two, but you don't want to have it. It's You feel terrified, you have a sort of flu-like symptom, and, and it passes, but you don't want that. Um, and it also just doesn't look as good. It, it makes the surface of the metal look a bit sort of dull and grey. You want shiny steel and like... So anyway, um, uh, so it was just galvanised fencing wire, which I would then uh, wind by hand at first round a dowel and then hacksaw from one end, one link at a time, and then linked together with pliers. It took flipping ages. Uh, later when I had access to the, uh, the metal workshop I could use a lathe and uh, with a steel rod I could put the lathe at a very slow speed and wind the wire on to make, make the coils, make these spring-like coils which I would then transfer to a wooden dowel and then hacksaw along. Still, It, it still took ages to do, so I ran out of links. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the, the metal uh, is quite thick metal. This is actually thicker metal than uh, most real armour uses. But again, I didn't know how thick armour should be, so um, I, I made it pretty stout. Although, you know, it's not too heavy. I've run about in this uh, for whole weekends at a time and uh, not come a cropper from the weight, so it's not too bad. Um, I don't actually know. I'll, I'll weigh, I will weigh this armour and I will put the weight of it there. Now, you say this armour, but how far down does this armour go? Well, if I had a cameraman, obviously he would tilt down the camera and then reveal all... But I don't have a cameraman, so... Um, and I can't get very far away from the camera because this room's not very big. So I'm going to stand uh, on my sofa and then you can go... There you go. You're going to have a look. There you go. So it uh, goes down to there. The front, not quite as far down at the back. And uh, that's the extent of it. So it's, uh, it's a jacket of... of this plate mail, 
Do we call it plate mail? You see, Gary Gygax of D&D fame called everything this mail, that mail, scale mail, plate mail, chain mail, and so forth. And an awful lot of people then reading that learn from it and, ha, plate mail is a thing. Only it's actually something that Gary Gygax seems to have made up. Or is it Gygax? No one really knows. Um, so, um, did armour like this ever exist? Well, actually, yes, we definitely did in World War I. Uh, when they were developing armour for tank crews, uh, they came up with this stuff. And I think you'll agree, that's pretty much what I've got. Mine's very slightly different design, but not very, not very different. So it, it is a type of armour that is practical and is historical and did actually work. Um, it does have a, a decent amount of flex in it. I can, maybe I could show you a bit better if I do that again. Uh, so, whoop, there we go. So I can, you know, it does, it does, it does flex like that. Um, and that's all you need, really. And uh, I can move my arms reasonably well. Like you can, you can hear that it's a little bit uh, noisy. Um, these bits of string uh, got added later uh, to cut down on a, a excessive flappage near the elbow. Um, how do you get in and out of it? Well, there's a join here at the front between this shoulder piece coming over my left shoulder and the main body. And there's another lace up on my shield side, left side down here at the front. Um, if I had a servant to help me put this on, perhaps I would put uh, this joint at the back and this joint at the back at the side as well. Um, but I didn't have a servant uh, to do that, so it was better to put it where I could actually get my own hands to it. Um, I wore this uh, in live action role play. I did actually, when I was in the reenactment society, get away with wearing this uh, quite a bit, though a lot of the time, partly in order to hide its semi inauthenticity, I wore it underneath. Uh, a tunic rather than on top of, um, but that had a second uh, bonus. You see, these rings, the big rings, are only butted together and they do keep coming apart. In fact, whilst putting this on in preparation for this video, by the way, I haven't worn this armour for so many years, I couldn't tell you how many, but I might not have worn this armour for over 10 years, longer than that. Um, I've got uh, half a dozen rings that, that, that plonked onto the floor. I don't think I actually opened them. I don't think I forced them open. I think I just dislodged them. They'd already been from previous activity uh, opened. I do remember getting very lucky once one weekend. Uh, we were fighting in, in woods uh, all day, every day. And uh, I noticed one of these little rings uh, in a clearing that we'd fought in many hours before. And I, I saw it just in between some fallen leaves in the middle of it. I just picked it. Oh, good Lord, a ring. Oh. If I've found one ring, how many others have fallen? Do you know, that was the only one that had fallen off. Uh, although when I undid my belt that evening and jumped up and down on the spot, there was a little light shower of rings that had been caught in the tunic. So that was one good reason to wear the tunic over the top. Um, so uh, that's, that shows you the, that there is a problem with this design. If you're using butted uh, rings to link everything together, then uh, they will inevitably be forced open. Although it has only happened with the ones on the corners. Um, so uh, you notice right now, for instance, there's one missing there, which is the bottom one on there. They've got one missing there, which is the leftmost there. Uh, there's one missing there, which is the topmost there. The middle rings, top and bottom and the sides, they never seem to get forced open. I've never known that happen. Uh, but uh, particularly, there are some key points where every single flipping time I went out in this armour, I lost loads of rings from those key points. So all the way along the bottom, for instance, in the picture that I'm going to show you here, all the way along the bottom of the armour, the very bottom ring, for some reason, I, I find it odd, I would have thought that that ring had actually very little to do, but those rings got forced open so often that I replaced them with fake rings. It's actually a thinner bit of wire that goes around twice and then twists, uh, linking back to itself, so it, it, it that can't be forced open. It's a bit of a cheat, it's not authentic, but at least it, it stopped my armour falling apart all the time. And I've uh, noticed I've done uh, in this, this key uh, ring here as well, I think that must have gone so many times that I just thought, right, I'm replacing that one with a, with a cheats ring. Um, so, uh, assuming you can get past the Forcing the, uh, forcing the rings open problem. It does actually work. It did exist, at least in World War I, um, but it's not completely and utterly kosher for the medieval period, alas. There were uh, types of armour that looked a bit like this, that involved square plates of various sorts, but not 
exactly like this. But there you go, I was 17 and the internet, uh, nobody had even thought of it. Um, and so I didn't have, and I was at a school in the middle of the country, I didn't have access to the information. I was just, I had what was in my head, what I'd seen in the movies and experimentation to go with. And I'll have you know that I did win a prize for metalwork. Um, and, but uh, maybe, maybe it would have been better if I could have found out more about the medieval period. So how could you find out more about the medieval period? Ah, well, yes, actually there's a way. There is a way. What you could do is you could go to the Great Courses Plus that has sponsored this video. And you could, you could uh, stream one of the videos. And there's even a way of doing it for free because on this enormous site, uh, which has loads of uh, lectures, uh, videos of lectures on it from distinguished professors from around the world, though largely America, um, uh, you can sample the delights for free by taking advantage of an offer which you can get to by typing in www.thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke Lindy Beige. That'll take you to a landing page where there's an offer of a free month's trial. And at the end of that month, if you decide eh, it's not for you, though you've watched a couple of courses and maybe you quite like them, but you don't want to pay, pay any money, well, you unsubscribe and then you won't have to pay any money. So it's win-win. So uh, option one is, is give it a go uh, and uh, option two is don't. Um, now, one of the courses there is on the High Medieval Period um, and uh, the lecturer is one Philip Dayleder, Philip Dayleder Fudd. That's right, I remember, Philip Dayleder Fudd. And uh, he is lecturing in the High Medieval uh, Period, which is 1000 to 1300, as I say, but is he any good? I mean, you know, what I can tell you, he's pretty good. Look, he introduces himself and look, just seconds later, bam! You see that? Scholar's Cradle and one on the move as well. Oh yeah, so he's a man to be reckoned with. Uh, I, I think you can probably, I think you can probably trust him. I mean, he's a fud. Um, but I know you might be worried in other ways. Will I get bored? Will I find myself distracted and staring out of the window? No, no, again, I think you'll find uh, that there's very little to be distracted by out of that window. Architecturally, I think, a little bit odd uh, to have a, a window like that that opens straight onto a brick wall, uh, but it still seems to get plenty of light, so I think we're all right. Um, so there you go. So. Um, the High Middle Ages, and there are 24 lectures there, each one of half an hour. So that's 12 whole hours of stuff. And admittedly, it's not all, all warfare, but you don't, you're not just interested in medieval warfare, right? Oh, you are. Okay, well, all right, there's some on medieval warfare, and there's some others that you don't have to see that are about other aspects of uh, the medieval period. So there you go, the Great Courses Plus. Why not give it a go? Now, um, you may be worried for me, you might be thinking, well, Lloyd, surely though, your head was vulnerable. Didn't people just keep hitting you on the head all the time? Didn't that happen to you? Um, no, actually, but that's because I had this. Yes, this is my first metal helmet that I made the year before, when I was 16 in that same metal workshop. So uh, this got the metal work prize uh, when I was 16. And when it did, it looked like it had been just dredged up from the bottom of the ocean. It was covered in, it almost looked like it was covered in barnacles or something. I had treated it uh, um, on my uh, metal workers' uh, instructors' instructions uh, with some chemical, phos it had phos in its chemical name, and this was meant to rust proof it. And no, it didn't. It just made it look really weird. And when I cleaned it, it went rusty anyway. So then I blacked it, I covered it in oil and burned the oil off. Uh, with this powerful heating torch flaming thing. It was great and it all went beautiful black burnish and it looked terrific until it went very rusty again, so that didn't work. Uh, eventually what uh, protected it from going bright orange with rust was just uh, putting uh, vegetable oil on it, just uh, just cooking oil, and that set like a sort of layer of varnish and, and it's fine. As you can see, it's not exactly shiny, uh, but it is quite an old helmet now. Um, now then, um, what sort of helmet is this? Well, um, those of you who know your Vendel helmets might recognise this as a Vendel style helmet. But again, uh, put together in my mind without actually access to um, accurate materials um, from just pictures that I'd seen and so forth. And uh, yeah, it's sort of what I generally liked in a helmet. Uh, this mail curtain at the back, that is actually authentic. Uh, admittedly, not brilliantly, that I've used galvanised wire again, but this, this putting a curtain of mail to cover the back of the head, that is authentic, and the way, it, way it's attached with holes drilled in, in the metal, that's fine too. So, so I got that right. Um, the bowl, now part of the reason this bowl is there is that someone else, I think it might have been Katie Arnanda, had uh, made a bowl but then abandoned it, and the metalwork teacher, when he found out that I was making a helmet, said, well, why don't you use that bowl? It's been abandoned, that's a good starting point. Uh, it didn't actually fit my helmet, and uh, you can see that if I hold it sideways, there's, there's daylight between the bowl and the, and the, and the top 
uh, Bob, but never mind, it's, it's a metal bowl, which is better than nothing. Um, and there are actually down market uh, helmets of this sort of period that are made out of bands like this with gaps. So that's not actually completely inauthentic, though I'll grant you it's not exactly impressively beautiful either. Um, and it's riveted together in this rather strong way, and it fits rather nicely. It's very comfy. I have worn this all day, every day, uh, for several days on the trot, no problem at all. And I like this helmet. Uh, the chin straps are just bits of leather here that are slightly rough, and you don't need to tie a bow or anything, just one over like that and, and you just give it, a, give it a quick pull. And again, I have run around all day um, and that has never ever come undone. It's super quick and easy to do. Um, so I, I suspect that that's actually a real way that a lot of helmets were put together because it just works so well. Um, right, it doesn't rattle around on my head. Uh, my ears uh, can hear fine. I can see absolutely fine. I've got decent vision up, a decent vision left and right, decent vision down. I've got really good vision in this, which admittedly came from R&D. My first design uh, had a narrower a hole in the front, but then when I put it on and realized that it was blocking a lot of my peripheral vision, I just widened it here and, uh, and that cured it fine. Um, I've got a nose guard here. Now a lot of people have said, but surely that nose guard, you know, if someone hit you really hard with an axe, it would just, it would just bend back into your face and it would, you'd get a broken nose or something. Well, yes, I, I think that could happen if someone hit me really hard there with an axe or something. Yes, that could happen. But what's the alternative? The alternative is you don't have a nose guard and the axe just it chops your head in two. So I'd rather have a broken nose than my head chopped in two, thank you very much. Um, but actual nose guards on actual uh, helmets that are found do tend to be more substantial than this. This nose guard is no thicker metal than, than the rest of the helmet. And um, actually uh, that should really be of uh, stouter stuff. But better still, surely, would be for this nose guard to carry on and join up with this uh, piece in front of my mouth and then that would be much stronger, but they didn't do that. Why didn't they? I, I don't think there's any particularly good reason. I, I think it's just the, to do with the ancestry of the helmet. There were, there were helmets with nose guards, there were helmets with cheek guards, they extended the cheek guards until they actually met, and that was the result they got. Um, starting from scratch, then yeah, I think they might actually have put that jumping over the mouth to attach there, and that would have made it a lot stronger. I think also, though, it, it's got a better face, it's got a better look. Uh, you, you see more of a, a human look with this with this arrangement as it is. And uh, how good is this? Well, I can say really good. I really like this design. Having fought in this helmet a hell of a lot, I can say that I really like it. And if I ever made um, a, a faintly similar helmet, I, I, might, I might make it very similar because what you can see and how much uh, protection this gives you, it's a very good ratio. And, gentle reader, and I would have no front teeth were it not uh, for this chin guard, because on two, two occasions, a gormless idiot rammed my shield into me, and the top edge of my shield went bang, right where my front teeth would have been, <sighs> were it not for this. So, I have front teeth, which are great, I like front teeth, and I have front teeth because of this bit of this helmet. Twice that happened. People seem to think, oh, you know, he's got a big shield, he's got a big helmet, I don't, it doesn't matter if I ram into him. Well, please, just because you see someone reasonably well protected, that uh, doesn't give you an excuse to uh, wallop them. Um, and that was odd. I do remember, for instance, uh, queuing for lunch uh, one Sunday at school whilst wearing this helmet, because, well, if you had a helmet like this, you would too, surely. And, um, and someone came up and just whacked me over the back of the head with a spoon. And uh, you could say, oh, pretty lucky you were wearing a helmet then. And well, yes, that's true. Otherwise it would have really hurt because it was a substantial spoon and it was a fair thwack. Uh, but on the other hand, it could be that he wouldn't have come up behind me and thwacked me on the head with a spoon had I not been wearing a helmet. So there's no way we can really be sure. Um, I do remember a, a teacher coming over and saying, take it off. But the thing is, it was Sunday. And on Sunday, there were no school uniform rules. And uh, I was able to uh, def defend my, my stance and I kept the helmet on. Uh, admittedly, I, I probably took it off later when, because it's quite difficult to get things into your mouth. With, but you could, you could, you could, you just, you'd have to be careful, wouldn't you, getting the, the fork and the spoon through there into your mouth. So I probably did take it off later. Yeah, I probably did. Uh, right, so there you go. Um, an introduction to some early armour of mine. Uh, this will, of course, be superseded by other forms of armour. Um, I've got the Mogul armour, of course, and I've got the Hoplite armour, which I made after this. 
And I've also got my mail armor, which I made after this. So I've got that, that was three more suits of armor that I made after this. Uh, and then, of course, I've got my, my gothic plate that's being made for me. Uh, so I'll have another suit of armor to show you. And, and won't that be fine? Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>